Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to finish up our lecture series on ultrastructural descriptive techniques and ultrastructural pathology. We're going to cover the rest of the infectious agents outside of viruses and bacteria, which we talked about in the last lecture, and we're going to look for just a moment at some neoplasms. Well, let's start with the protozoa and the one that ultrastructure is fantastic for is the apicomplexin parasites. I had somebody just sent me some pictures the other day on a computer and at 40x you could tell that there was something in the bottom of of all of the cells in the duodenum. Okay and whereas everyone else was saying hey do IHC or do PCR I said you know, the quick way to figure out if you're dealing with coccidiosis is simply to take an electron micrograph because the coccidia, which are part of the AP complexins, they have very characteristic structures. They're not difficult to identify. Now, you can't tell one species from another, but it's fairly easy to identify AP complexins. These have shown up year after year on various certification exams because it's a very characteristic description of these agents on ultrastructure. Before we start, we can look at a diagram so we know exactly what we're looking at. And this is your typical zoite of an apicomplexin, which, which could be Imeria, could be Toxoplasma, could be Sarcocystis, Franchilia. There are so many uh, different genuses in there, but they're all basically the same. They are elliptical structures often sort of banana shaped, but you shouldn't say that because you shouldn't be a food pathologist. And at the apical end, they have several very characteristic and stereotypical structures, including the conoid ring, small rod-like structures called micronemes, and larger ones called rod trees. And here's a, a color version for those of you who like color with the conoid being here in pink, the micronemes being here in green, but I think they've made these a little too big because they're almost the size of the rop trees. In most cases, rop trees are two or three times the size. Um, there are also polar rings, which is really only at one pole as well. And it, sometimes you can see these subpolicular microtubules in the wall of the uh, AP complexin, but not too often. Now, for every AP complexin, those are things that you absolutely want to describe. The conoid ring, the rop trees, and the micronemes. It's going to be inspected in your description. The thing is, very few people really know, besides knowing how to identify and describe them, what they do. And they're all involved in the entrance of AP complexins into cells and their survival within. Um, they all come to play within the first 20 minutes of invasion of a cell by whether it's Toxoplasma, Imeria, or whatever. And the micronemes are the first to use. They are used in attachment. The, uh, the AP complexin will attach at this top end or polar end. And then as it invades the cell, the rop trees are ingested and they begin to form the wall of the parasitophorus vacuole. And using the conoid and the rop trees, the parasite can activate this actin myosin complex within itself and pull itself into the, uh, into the parasitophorus vacuole within the cell. And then the dense granules are released to make a, a beneficial environment for the protozoan as well as to finish up the making of the parasitophorus vacuole. So they're all used within about 20 minutes and then uh, once invaded these, these uh, uh, either the parasitophorus vacuole will break down and the AP complexins will be left to be free in the cell or they'll be maintained. And certain species have them, certain species don't. I generally don't keep track of that kind of stuff. Um, and then they will begin to replicate, eventually forming a cyst within the cell in which they replicate and the cell will rupture and those zoites will be free to liberate, uh, be liberated and to invade other cells. So that's the basic kinetics and life cycle 
of the, of the zoites. After one or two passages, they will turn into microgametes or microgamots and form oocysts. So the zoite is there to invade a lot of cells. The gametes are there to form oocysts, and which will be shed into the environment and either picked up by another intermediate host or a, a definitive host. Okay, finally, all the clicking did something. This might be the best picture I've ever seen of any AP complexins, and it's almost impossible as you cut through these cysts to get an AP complexin that is cut just perfectly so you can see all of the structures within one. Usually you get a multiple of tangential sections. You get to see uh, a conoid in one and some rock trees in another and the nucleus in another and it's sort of an aggregate of several ones. But this one is pr almost perfectly uh, sectioned. So here at the apex we can see the conoid ring. Okay, here are the micronemes here and here. And the way to remember that is micro, meaning they're smaller than the rock trees. And the rock trees are, are bigger and longer. And sometimes you cut them obliquely like this. Sometimes you cut them uh, basically uh, horizontally like this or vertically. So, um, and so here we see conoid, microneme, rock trees. The nucleus is always at the base. There is a little Golgi there, but I almost never see it. And then you have a number of granules within. These could be rock trees. Um, these have been variously, variously referred to as amylopectin granules or starch granules uh, in protozoa. And I would find either of those acceptable. They do have traditional mitochondria here. And if you are looking for, it's really difficult, the subpollicular microtubules you can see in some areas as, as going down the outside of the AP complexins. Okay, I usually don't pay too much attention to that. So this has just absolutely everything that you would want to diagnose it. Here is one with a lot of micronemes here, maybe a rock tree or two. This one has the conoid and some micronemes micronemes, starch granules, and so over and over, stereotypical. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at Imeria, you're looking at uh, any of the AP complexins, they're all the same. And here is, uh, and we can put some of this together, this is a cyst of toxoplasma, and these are all of the zoites, and you can see the conoid here in this one, lots of micronemes in this one, and some rock trees, couple rock trees here. And we are within the heart muscle of a pig. With so little heart muscle to look at, it's sort of tough to say heart muscle or skeletal muscle on this one. But certainly you would identify heart muscle, these being the intercalated discs here as these, these densities. Just this is a picture, let me see if I can move that over a little bit. Oh, there we go. A nice picture of the initial uh, invasion of toxoplasma into some host cell, okay? And you will see gradually the disappearance of the rock trees and the micronemes as it creates the parasitophorus vacuole. Another great picture, let me move it so we can get a nice, here's your subpollicular microtubules and your conoid ring. So if you could imagine, um, essentially, the contraction of these microtubules and associated other filaments will allow the AP complexin to push itself into that host cell. It's all really cool. And this is a really cool picture of that conoid ring in your subpollicular microtubules. This is a picture of a tissue cyst of toxoplasma within the hepatocyte of a kitten. How do you get there? You don't, okay? What we have are numerous zoites 
in an indeterminate cell, the fact that there is lipid helps us to, to uh, cut down the numbers, but there are other cells that store lipid to renal tubular epithelium, and cats will store lipid, obviously, adipocytes, but I can't remember the last time I saw toxoplasma in an adipocyte, and it's pretty common in the liver and the intestine of cats. So, yes, cats are the, the uh, usually the definitive host, but they can also be infected as an intermediate host with a number of cysts and other agents, especially in immunosuppressed cats or very young cats. So, but if you told me that this was uh, any of the other AP complexins, whether it's sarcocyst or, or Frankelia or Hymondia or any, I would have to agree with you because I can't tell one from another. Now remember we talked about after one or two passages of the zoites, eventually they will develop into uh, gametes, which are, are the microgametes, which are the male equivalent, and the macrogametes, which are the female equivalent. I use those terms very loosely, um, but we're looking at, this is also a cat, uh, as it goes through the sexual phase, you can see that the microvilli are present. They're all the same size, so that's a clue that we're in the, the GI tract. There are a lot of uh, either dilated profiles of SER or pinocytotic vesicles, which appear to be absorbing nutrients. Largely, it will be absorbing fat around this, which is helpful. And then the gamons are full of these uh, vacuoles. I hate to use the term vacuoles, but or I think they use the term lamellar bodies. But but if you're familiar with the the appearance of macrogamonts under the microscope, you recognize that the macrogamonts have a lot of large, bright pink granules. Okay, I always say that you know, the, the macrogamonts are real flashy. They have a lot of bling. Um, and what these uh, contain is the compounds that are used to form the shell around the oocysts. Okay, the macrogametes, um, if you see them under the scope, they simply look like a lot of little blue-black dots in the cytoplasm. I'm not exactly sure what all of that is. You know, I'm sure there's there's DNA and, and, and other things in there, but this is what it would look like uh, on ultrastructure. You don't have these nice big pink granules within, just a bunch of little dots. And so that's, uh, I guess, about as much as I want to say about AB complexins. But I think it's something that if you're going to learn any ultrastructure, a good description of a zoite uh, from any of the AP complexins is an absolute must because they do pop up on a very regular basis on different certification examinations. Um, I did mention the term parasitophorus vacuole. I don't put a lot of store in it. I don't understand it properly. Here are two cysts. This, this particular tissue cyst has the zoites which are free in the cytoplasm. This one is surrounded by a very thick wall. Uh, toxoplasma is one that supposedly forms a parasitophorous vacuole. Uh, neospora uh, is one that lives free in the cytoplasm of cells. So I think for me, if I can get to, uh, if I can get to that I'm dealing with AP complex and parasite and I can identify the tissue, I think I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I probably cheat more and I play the vet game probably more than I should, uh, but I'm not Dr. J.P. Doobie. So if I'm looking at the muscle, heart muscle, skeletal muscle, or the nervous tissue of a dog and I see a lot of zoites, I understand that it could be toxo, but that generally is the province of Neospora. We call that playing the vet game. You don't have real evidence, but you've got a lot of circumstantial evidence. 
So I think it's nice to know what the peristophorus vacuole looks like, that it should be in uh, surrounding the zoites of toxoplasma, but a lot of cases I've seen just don't have them or maybe they're sectioned badly. So, but I put it out there so you, uh, you've seen one. Okay, another AP complexin parasite, which uh, is not a true intercellular, it's sort of a modification, is cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium is an intracellular parasite, but it is so on the edge, it lives just inside of the cell membrane. We're looking at cryptosporidium, uh, which is lining the ileum of a hamster. And now that you're getting really good at this game, you're gonna be able to identify the cells that are degenerating because they're bulging, because the cytoplasm is loosened, because you have dilated profiles, a smooth endoplasmic reticulum, because you have loss of the surface substructure. Okay, and then lining this are various uh, schizonts of cryptosporidium. There may be a gamont or two here um, but largely they're schizonts and they contain zoites, some of which now are free. As we said, this is an intracellular parasite. It is known as being intracellular and extracellular, extracytoplasmic, um, which means it sits just inside the cell membrane because it uses the cell to provide energy. But outside of the cytosol proper. So you always see them on sitting on top of the apical cytoplasm. They have what is known as a feeder organelle, which is the area of contact with the cell. So here are cross sections of all of the zoites. And if we got really, really close, and this is a, a, a picture, it's not the best one I, I ever shot, but if you get close, you'll see all of the conoid ring and the, the rock trees and everything and the zoites. Now, I want to go back to the last one because hopefully some of you were yelling at me saying, hey, there's something else going on in that picture. And yes, there actually is. Okay, there's an arrow here and it's pointing to these curvilinear bacteria, which are present in the apical cytopl excuse me, the apical cytoplasm. I told you this was a hamster and hamsters are one and, and one of the prototypical species that are infected with Lawsonia intracellularity. Lawsonia being an intracellular bacteria, it lives in the apical cytoplasm. If you put a silver stain on this, they would light up very brightly. It causes tremendous proliferation of the glandular mucosa and uh, you, we see Lawsonia in a wide range of species primarily in the ileum, sometimes like in the ferret, we see it in the colon, um, but we see it in hamsters and pigs, ferrets, horses, rabbits, and that's about most of the species, probably one or two more that I am forgetting. I think this is an absolutely great picture. Here's another AP complexin and we are in the brain of an ox. Maybe it's a young ox from South America. And what we're looking at here is we are looking at our friends, the erythrocytes. This is a capillary and the erythrocytes have adhered to the wall of this vessel and they contain one or two apicomplexins of the genus Babesia, um, and this is Babesia bovis. And this is a very characteristic uh, behavior for erythrocytes that are parasitized um, by a number of apicomplexins, whether it's Babesia or certain forms of, of plasmodium. And what happens is it causes an increased uh, adherence of cells to the walls of capillaries all over the body. In certain parts of the body, you actually get a color change in the brain, which is usually, you know, sort of a very light pink. The brain will become a darker pink. And in some circles, it's known as pink brain because what this does is it prevents these erythrocytes from going to the spleen 
and being phagocytized. Now, how this agent knows to do this, how and then, you know, how it's able to exert this effect is anyone's guess, but it's well known in, in blood parasites that you have sequestration of infected uh, of infected erythrocytes in capillaries all over the body. So it's an amazing evolutionary adaptation and a great electron micrograph. Okay, how could you tell you were in the brain? What are these over here? Myelinated neurons. So at least I think brain be a good one and, and hopefully you put enough of this picture together, play the vet game with me and say, marginated erythrocytes with parasites? Yeah, I'm in the brain, but if you said spinal cord, I don't think I could really uh, disagree with you too hard. Okay, this is a, a very complex picture, and all of these arrows don't really help too much. But if I told you that you were in the skin of a dog, I believe this actually was published as the skin of a horse, Okay, we can start identifying some of the cell types in here. I think if you look at these multi-lobated nuclei, we've talked about this, and these are neutrophils. Then we have a couple of other cells here, here, and here, and one that has engulfed one, maybe two, that have engulfed a number of... Uh, what are referred to as kinetoplastids, um, and that's a very small grouping, which only, uh, to my knowledge, includes leishmania and and uh, trypanosoma. Um, but you can, if you look closely, you can see pseudopods from these cells, and if we look at these amastigotes of Leishmania. There's probably 10 or 15 in each cell. We have to get a, little, get a little closer to see the diagnostics thing, but hopefully you're starting to see that they are within the cytoplasm of these two macrophages. You can see a nucleus, and then you can see another structure within. If we get a little closer, okay, we have a nucleus, and then we have this bar-shaped structure, which is known as, here's another one, here's another one, which is known as a kinetoplast. It is the mitochondrian analog of uh, Leishmania and Trypanosoma cruzi. It contains DNA like any self-respecting mitochondria. And this is a great picture. Uh, it's, uh, here's our macrophage again. We have various, probably, phagolysosomes, which contain cellular debris. Um, and then if you look at the orientation of the kinetoplast to the nucleus, it is perpendicular to it, and it looks like a lollipop. And Dr. Chris Gardner, many years ago, uh, made, gave the quote that has been passed down and passed down and not attributed well. But he is the man who wrote the metazoan and protozoan books, which you should get a copy of because they're fantastic books. They're very inexpensive um, through the Davis Foundation. But if you, uh, he used to say, L is for lollipop, L is for leishmania. Okay, so that's, that's the best I can say. If it looks like a lollipop, you're probably looking with leishmania. And a lot of times you can't see kinetoplast very well. You have to go up and down on your microscope. But some of the cues that I would think about when I'm trying to differentiate leishmania from trypanosoma is the fact that trypanosoma cruzi is almost exclusively seen in muscle, especially heart muscle. You can see it in smooth muscle in the intestine. And it has a a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. When you're looking at leishmania, uh, it is more commonly seen in a range of 
organs. Uh, in the skin, it has very commonly a plasmacytic infiltrate. Now that picture I showed you didn't have any plasma cells to speak of. It was macrophages and neutrophils. But there's a lot of plasma cells that we see that are associated with Leishmania infections that you don't really see. It's going to be a lot more antigenic. Uh, than you that you see in Trypanosoma cruzi, and you can see it in just about any organ. I don't know as much about trypanosomiasis and malaria uh, than I should. Um, I can tell you that um, the modal flagellated form that circulates in the bloodstream has been seen and is well documented in trypanosoma, but no one has ever found this form of leishmania. We only find the tissue amastigotes in leishmania. I'm sure there must be one, um, but there's not. And I just like this picture. Um, this is trypanosoma congolensi in an ox, and it looks like they're playing uh, water polo or maybe soccer or for those of you outside the U.S., they're playing football. Um, the other thing that you can see is, you know, there are a lot of structures. They're typical AP com complex, and so you can see some rock trees, but they're also flagellated. So this is the anchor point, and we've seen it before with Helicobacter, where they, ha they anchor their flagella, and if we got close, we would see that very characteristic 9 plus 2 arrangement, this common cilia throughout uh, almost every organism on this particular planet. Other protozoans that are fun, and this one I always feel sorry for Giardia. Giardia gets blamed for a whole lot of dire cases of diarrhea. I don't think it uh, that it's responsible for. I've always been sort of suspect of cases of Giardia diarrhea in veterinary species because you can find it in a lot of normal feces but but this is cool and if you look you can see and you know what Giardia looks like it has multiple flagella up to eight flagella and and you can count these on here's one here's two here's three this might be four and there's there's quite a few so you can always find the uh, tail end of the flagellums on these they have a a sucker plate which is on the bottom, but unlike the feeder organelle of, uh, uh, of Cryptosporidia, they do no damage to the underlying microvilli or cell surface. They just sort of sit there. I think they probably uh, just subside on whatever's coming through the gut at any particular time. They do very little damage. So I think they get a bad rap, but that's what Giardia looks like. When we go to the amoebas, uh, this is Entamoeba histolytica, and remember that most of our amoeba in the body, we all have them, and they're free living, they live in the gut, and they just live on detritus and bacteria. And here's one that has ingested a number of bacteria, and their mitochondria are these lamellar stacks, which are really sort of cool. And one of the things that, that I think is missing when you get to, uh, uh, when you get to uh, ultrastructure on these on the on the scope you get a very nice equivalent of a nucleus called a karyosome and I just don't think it shows up very well on uh, uh, on most ultrastructure of amoeba but they have a lot of phagolysosomes within their uh, within their structure but the lamellar the lamellar mitochondrial analogs make them look sort of cool. Remember the vast majority don't do anything. Um, it's only when you really upset the balance, uh, especially the bacteria flora, that they decide to go on their walkabouts inside tissue and can cause some significant problems in various animal species like primates, non-human and human, and reptiles, various reptiles. Look at a couple of fungi. And fungi, um, are interesting because they have this really thick cell wall okay and it's beautiful um, this is blastomyces and we are seeing it in the process of budding 
especially narrow based budding. That's a term I don't really understand because you would think when it started it was broad based and eventually it got to narrow based. I don't, I've never understood how it really made any difference whether it was broad or narrow. I think it's more when you catch them. But, but uh, I think a lot of the starch of the cell wall is digested during processing because I am always amazed that the cell wall of fungi can be so thick and you can see inner structures on EM, but bacteria, which is much thinner, you can't. But you can see they have a lot of starch granules, they have a nucleus, they have cytosol, um, they will have sometimes chloroplasts within them, certain type of algae um, will do that. But they're characterized, most importantly, by their very thick cell wall. And the other thing that hopefully you will notice is this little structure right here. And if you, you see enough of these, you will realize that that is a pseudopod of a macrophage. And when you have uh, infections with blastomycosis or any of the other dimorphic fungi, usually macrophages are a very prominent part of the immune response. So don't be, um, don't be surprised if you see macrophages or you see these swallowed by macrophages. There's always inflammatory cells around fungal infections. And another agent that is a fungal infection that causes a pretty profound granulomatous response is uh, pneumocystis. Uh, pneumocystis, carinii, and all of the various forms that have come out of that, including Wakefieldii, Murina, and uh, uh, now we're starting to name them based on the species. They are fine. They are omnipresent fungi. We all have them and um, usually our cell-mediated immunity, uh, which is lymphocyte-driven, keeps them in check. But if you're severely immunosuppressed and you have no cell-mediated immunity, then they will flourish, especially in the lung. And hopefully you had seen there's a lot of white space here. We have a capillary. We have these big blocky uh, type 2 pneumocytes and some macrophages. And what we're looking at here are the, uh, uh, the trophozoites of pneumocystis. And you're saying trophozoite, that's a weird word for a fungus. This is bounced back and forth between being called a protozoan, a protist, and a fungus. And finally, I think that the world has decided that based on a lot of molecular tests that these are fungi, but we still call them trophozoites. Hopefully we'll get past that one day. But you can see uh, most of these are empty. They are collapsed forms of this particular agent, and there's nothing there. Um, if we want to look at the rest of this EM, you have a lot of type 2 pneumocytes. Remember, you're not going to get any, uh, any oxygen transfer here. Type 2 pneumocyte, type 2 pneumocyte, type 2 pneumocyte. You can see the lamellar bodies of surfactant. I would like to make sure that, and here's some more with what looks to be surfactant. Maybe one or two of these are macrophages. And then we have an erythrocyte. We also have a lot of cells that are marginating here. So I can't tell you whether those are hypertrophic septal macrophages. Uh, perhaps those are lymphocytes that are passing by, but there are a lot of extra cells in this alveolar wall. And then the empty trophozoites or trophocysts of uh, pneumocystis. Here's one of the living forms of pneumocystis, and you can see the, the actual trophozoites within. Everything else here and here and here and here, these are all collapsed, empty cysts. And uh, there's a lot of surfactant, a lot of cellular debris, but if you look at the top here, you can see all the pseudopods because this is a granulomatous infection. And, or at least histiocytic infection because these animals do not have cell-based immunity. So they fight them with what they have left. And those are neutrophils and a lot of macrophages. It's a great lesion, both on ultrastructure and under the microscope where it looks like soap bubbles, little pink soap bubbles filling up all the alveoli. Another busy picture and thank God for the inset. You know, 
If you're ever in a certifying examination and they give you something with an inset, look at the inset first. It's going to sell you, save you a whole lot of heartburn. And uh, we just mentioned in passing uh, algae. There are two significant pathogenic algae which we see in animal species, Prototheca and Chlorella. Chlorella is the one that has chloroplasts. Um, chlorella, uh, Prototheca does not. But it is characterized by a, in, in any diagnostic photo, um, you will see uh, you will see reproduction within the uh, macrophage. It's a, it's a form of endosporulation, and sometimes you end up. Whereas most of nature goes two, four, eight, sixteen. Sometimes it's a little goes a little awry, and so this tripartite uh, division, where you have three uh, uh, endospores, uh, is not uncommon with Prototheca. Um, and depending upon your, your own uh, political leaning, you may see this as a peace sign or you may see it as the emblem of Mercedes-Benz. I've heard it described both ways. Um, most of these end up that you see because they are enmeshed in granulomous inflammation. Here's a plasma cell up here. Um, a lot of these are empty, um, just the cell walls. And that's what you see in both pneumocystis and Prototheca. Uh, infections. This one was Prototheca zapfii in dog skin. So, and, and most of these are just macrophages which have gobbled up. Um, here's the nucleus of macrophage, here's another nucleus of a macrophage, and a lot of defunct uh, Prototheca. And here's a picture of chlorella. Here's that tripartite division. You like that one? Okay. And you can see the chloroplasts. These extra granules that you see are actually chloroplasts, which uh, in severe infections, they do have a greenish discoloration to them. Okay. Well, that covers the infectious agents. Um, what I'd like to do is take the last 10 minutes, and it won't take long, to talk about neoplasms. Okay, any good neoplasm or diagnosable neoplasm is going to resemble the tissue that it originates. Okay, neoplasms recapitulate the tissue that they come from. So essentially, if you're good at normal by this point, you're going to be very good at diagnosing neoplasia. And I want to show you just a couple just for fun. Now, the diagnosis of neoplasia by EM base is based on you know how well the tissue recapitulates obviously benign tumors tend to recapitulate uh, the tissue of origin quite well and they're very diagnosable uh, certain tumors like tumors of endocrine tissue even the malignant tumors tend to be very bland and tend to resemble the tissues that they arise from very well um, you can't diagnose a neoplasm, a true neoplasm, simply by looking at four or five cells under, a, uh, under the electron microscope. This is why I say over and over again, you need to make correlation between the slide, which shows a, a nodule or obvious neoplasm, versus what you go in to look at. We do still use the... EM lab to make diagnoses on certain types of neoplasms. Even with immunohistochemistry, I found that it doesn't work all the time, and I think that uh, you probably found the same thing too. Um, there are still a number of cases that we will send routinely to EM, including those endocrine tumors, where we're looking for dense core granules um, to help with the diagnosis. Granular cell tumors, we will often go to see, is it, these are granules, are they lysosomes or are they mitochondria? And we've talked about some cell types like Herthel cells or uh, laryngeal rhabdomyomas, which have lots of mitochondria, and that's a very easy diagnosis. And uh, um, we do occasionally still send uh, a melanotic melanomas to see if we can find melanosomes. So I think that there is a use for EM in uh, tumor diagnosis, but it's probably a lot less than it used to be with the advent of immunohistochemistry. But let's look at some that are great, and this was a tumor that was sent off 
to the laboratory and hopefully at this point you're going to look at these tubulo vesicular cristi and say that's probably adrenal cortical or interstitial cell from the uh, uh, testis. I don't know why anyone would send off uh, a testis for EM, but adrenal cortical tumors, especially in certain species, you can have some morphologic overlap between uh, FIOs and adrenal tumors, especially in some of the wacky adrenal tumors you see in ferrets. And so it's very helpful to get a good look at those Christe to say, ah, this is a steroid producing. So if you had an adrenal adenoma in a dog, this would be a great EM for something like that. These don't show up very often on exams because they're just boring. It's just normal. It's a lot of normal. Hoo-ha, as they say. I see a lot of dense core granules. So this is, uh, if it was from the adrenal, we would call it pheo. If it is from the, uh, the thyroid, we would probably call it a C-cell tumor. And if it is from the middle of nowhere, we might call it a paraganglioma or a neuroendocrine neoplasm. Is this a neuroendocrine carcinoma or a neuroendocrine, benign neuroendocrine tumor? I can't tell. It's one cell. Give me a break. Okay, that is one of the big problems with neoplasms and ultrastructure. You look at one or two cells and it's, how are you gonna tell what the activity of that is? I just wanna trick you a little bit here, okay? Or at least make you remember. If the granules are central, it's an epinephrine producing tumor. Who cares? If they're atypical, it's norepinephrine. This was also a pheo. They're atypical. It was producing norepinephrine. But the one thing I wanted you to remember is, could this be chlamydia? Okay, one of the things that sort of helps is they're not in any cysts or vacuoles or, or anything like that. They're loose in the cytoplasm. Um, but could these all be elementary bodies of chlamydia? I want you to think about that real quick as things run through your head. But I don't see a single reticulate body or an intermediate body. They're free in the cytoplasm. And so this is okay for a norepinephrine secreting neoplasm. The vast majority of fields don't really do anything, or maybe they secrete at such a low level that we don't pick it up. Tissue from a ferret. Bingo. Okay. We have dense core granules, but they are linear. So this will be an islet cell tumor. Is it malignant or benign? Well, I'm going to tell you that the chances are 995 times out of 1,000, it's going to be benign because that's just the nature of them in ferrets. Well, I can't tell you anything looking at this. Okay. But I can tell you it's beta cell. Remember, the, the islet cell, which is the next one over, has perfectly round granules. More dense core granules. This is one from a C cell. This is uh, also known as, you know, medullary thyroid carcinomas in bulls, but it's just dense core granules. So we know they're of, of a neural crest and a chromaffin derivation. But if you told me this was from the adrenal medulla, okay, I'm going to give that to you. Ah, okay. I wish we were just a little closer, but these are cells that are just absolutely cram-packed with mitochondria. So you have to know where you're from. This was from the thyroid gland. This was a picture of a herthal cell tumor. Some people call them oncocytomas. You can see oncocytic change in the salivary gland, ductal epithelium, where you get cells that look like this. They don't generally form tumors. I don't know if I've ever seen uh, a salivary oncocytoma, but I suppose that it could happen. You can also see this, although there is no uh, uh, myofilaments, but you would have to think about laryngeal have the myoma, but knowing it's from a thyroid, these are herthal cell tumors, and it's just a lot of mitochondria.
this is one that nobody really goes to EM with. Um, and, and the characteristic of these cells is the tremendous interdigitating that you see. And there are a couple of, of different neoplasms that will do this. Meningiomas like to do this, especially the meningothelial uh, meningiomas. And it's just a mass of, of interdigitating processes. And they also have these indented nuclei. I've also seen this in nerve sheath tumors with a lot of plications and interdigitating. Um, this was great stuff, folks, before there was immunohistochemistry, before we had uh, a GFAP and, and, and SOX10 and all of the markers that we use for the nerve sheath tumors now. And this is what we had. And they also had desmosomes, which were sort of cool, but they formed desmosomes. The meningiomas will occasionally form desmosomes. Okay, this was a similar tumor. This was a schwannoma in the heart of a rat. A lot of these interdigitating membranes and maybe some rudimentary attempt at desmosomes and some indented nuclei. But, uh, you know, back before we had all this immuno, it was a little different. This, these cells were incredibly pink. And what we're looking at are huge numbers of lysosomes. This is a granular cell tumor. Okay, and this is the other form. Okay, granular cell tumors. Uh, I believe this was in the meninges of a rat. And it's just lots and lots of lysosomes with cellular debris. I think the majority of the granular cell tumors I've sent to EM come back with a lot of lysosomes rather than mitochondria. And when I see something like this and, and on the microscope, it's big pink granules, I'm just gonna go granular cell tumor. Whether it's the tongue of the dog or it's the uh, lung of a horse or whatever. Nowadays we stain those for S100, but uh, this is what most of your granular cell tumors look like. I've seen them anywhere from uh, non-human primates down to fish and they all look like this with just this huge number of lysosomes. So this would be a great picture of a granular cell tumor. Another one, I think this was a, a fish. It might have been a, uh, a lung fish, if I remember correctly, but all of these are lysosomes with debris within them. Another granular cell tumor, and this was from the skin of a rat all lysosomes. This was published a number of years ago in VetPath, and if you get nice and close, you see the intricate scroll work of mast cell granules. So this is a mast cell tumor in a horned owl. And remember, if these degranulate, you're just gonna see little clear holes in the cytoplasm. Here's one with a lot of clear holes. Okay, sorry, my phone rang. So back to, uh, back to another neoplasm. Uh, and this one has a lot of, a bunch of cells with a tremendous number of cleared vacuoles. There's some that have some black or gray material. They're round, they're pushing everything outside. And this was published as a liposarcoma. We did look early on at a what a traditional uh, adipocyte would be with one big vacuole. These have lots of, of little ones. And uh, can you get to fat-laden cells? I think you can. Can you get to liposarcoma or any type of malignancy? Absolutely not. You're not going to, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, a common mistake for young residents to look at cytology and they've got one or two cells and they're all of a sudden we're diagnosing malignancies, the world's smallest single cell malignancy. So use a little bit of common sense. And I think at this point you would say this is a fat laden cell, but there are other cells that you know, could, could conceivably do something like that too, especially 
when you're in neoplasm. What other fun stuff do we have? Okay, we looked at something like this earlier, and I just, this is a different slide, but a uh, uh, very similar. And we have these cells with these long tendrils. They're attached to each other. It's not as prominent as the other one I showed you, but you see these keratin filaments almost going from one cell to another. This is a, a squamous cell carcinoma. Once again, the same proviso, you're looking at four or five cells. So you have to make that correlation with, uh, you have to make that correlation with uh, what you see on the slide. But this is a very nice showing the keratin intermediate filaments, the intercellular bridges, the intercellular edema pulling these cells apart. Going back to skin tumors, we, we looked at this before, and this is one of the cases we would take back to the electron microscopy, obviously before we had good melanocyte markers. And, and for me, melanocyte markers don't work all the time anyhow. But you can see a variety of melanosomes. Remember, they look like little footballs or little watermelons with the, the stripes that are parallel to to the, the structure itself. And this is before they are outfitted with melanin pigment, which accumulates on these melanosomes. So this probably, we wouldn't have sent it unless it was amelanotic. Um, and usually we run, uh, we would run some histochemical stains on that, like a Worth and Starry uh, 3.2, which is nice for picking up uh, melanosomes with just a little bit of pigment or a Fontana Massans. Um, but the problem with silver stains is they're dirty and they don't often give you a really great diagnosis. So uh, on the tough cases, we would go back to EM. I think that because of the time frame that is lost uh, with doing EM, it's, it takes a while to, to make the grids and to stain them properly and all that. Um, we're in a, a world of instant gratification, so we just prefer being able to uh, run IHC. But, but still for melanomas, I think there is use for electron microscopy. We've talked about uh, the beautiful scroll work in mast cells and just a, a, a couple of pictures of this lovely mast cell scroll work that you'll see in, in certain mast cells or basophils being ocean-going uh, mast cells, and just really nice. This here is a lysosome, okay? It doesn't have this scroll work in there, a couple of lysosomes down deep. Oh boy, these are in absolutely no rhyme or reason, but they're fun, so we'll just finish it up. Uh, muscle tumors. Nowadays, we have a lot of immunohistochemistry and muscle-specific actin and desmin and, and DRG, uh, myoglobin. We have a range of them at our disposal. But back before that was, if you thought you had a rhabdomyosarcoma or rhabdomyoma, you would take it to EM and see if you could pick out uh, myofilaments. This was a rhabdomyosarcoma from a rat. I think that most of the ones that come out nicely like this, these are ones that uh, you probably made the diagnosis on the H&E slide, but somebody was being thorough and you could see the, the myofilaments and the Z-bands very nicely in this particular spindle cell. My experience is they look more like this and you really have to do a lot of imagination um, to make these into any type of arrangement of actin and myosin. Uh, but nowadays it's mostly a, a, a immunohistochemical diagnosis and you only go to ultrastructure if you got something really good for publication. Here's another rhabdomyosarcoma. Can you make myofilaments out of this? That's a tough one, but you do have a lot of really nice uh, mitochondria. So that's part of the game, right? Big mitochondria and myofilaments. 
you can sort of see a sarcomere right here. C band, Z band, and some myofilaments. This was from the larynx of a dog, as a matter of fact. More mitochondria, like I said, than myofibrils. This smooth muscle tumor um, looks so much like smooth muscle with the dense bodies here that you're hard pressed to know, did I actually take a picture of a neoplasm or is this just a random smooth muscle? A lot of the nuclei are generally oblong or boxcar oval shaped. This one has the crinkle shape or the accordion shape that you can see in some uh, uh, smooth muscle tumors and some people say well that's what makes it malignant. Uh, I don't think so. Um, and this is one that breaks the rule about you are um, judged by the company you keep. A lot of collagen here. Uh, maybe um, this was taken from the uterus so maybe this would qualify if I had the slide in front of me as a fibromyoma. Very common in certain species like goats and people but uh, so this is but it really looks very much like smooth muscle doing a great job of recapitulating smooth muscle and our final uh, is a, a great publication from uh, many years ago this is uh, this is from a skin tumor in a dog um, and this uh, shows the characteristic cerebriform nuclei of epitheliotropic lymphoma. You know, the one that goes into the uh, epidermis or the follicular epithelium and, and forms aggregates of cells called potriase microabscesses. Before, and, and a lot of you are not going to believe this, but I've been doing this since long before there was even CD3 markers. And so, you know, we would see that and you know, one of the options was to go to EM with it and try and get a little closer. And they do have these bizarre nuclei, which sometimes I pretend I can see on the microscope. But under EM, it looks really good. This is back when we even called it mycosis fungoides, which is a human term and really not much like epitheliotropic, cutaneous epitheliotropic lymphosarcoma. Um, but that brings us to pretty much the end of the lecture. I want to mention a couple of textbooks. This is an older slide, so some of them are in additional editions uh, by now. Weider's Functional Histology is a human text. It's probably in seventh or eighth edition, but it's great because in addition to the histology, they have a lot of really good ultrastructure, and some of the images that I used were from that. Uh, Cell Path is no longer available. It's out of print. Uh, Cheville's Ultrastructure Real, Ultrastructural Pathology, has a second edition. I think that will be the last edition. And I think that it's a really, really good text. It's the best text out there on ultrastructural pathology. Uh, for those of you, if there are any of you who like this, there is a need for new textbooks. But because so many, uh, so many labs have, have, have done away with their EM, scopes. They're expensive. They, you have to have very specialized technicians. Um, and we now have a plethora of additional uh, diagnostic modalities like immunohistochemistry and ISH and PCR. We tend not to uh, uh, use the EM very much. I miss those pictures in a lot of the journal articles that used to be replete with them. This is this last one. Um, you maybe will find an old copy of this. It's a human book. It's Gaudiola's Ultrastructure of the Cell Matrix. They have like 30 pages on different types of mitochondria and, and, and different types of Golgi. And um, it, it basically focuses on the cell variations of normal and certain disease uh, types. And it's a, it's a two volume set. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, it might be actual overkill, but uh, I think these are all good, very good. And then, then of course, you want to, if you're preparing for a certification examination, you may want to scour recent issues of VetPath, um, especially JVDI and, and ToxPath, 
Um, they do have some ultra structure in them. My biggest complaint is because they're there to illustrate a point in a article, it's very high magnification. Hey, we took these pictures of the virus. They don't publish the ones, and, and obviously it costs money to publish pictures in a journal. They don't publish the, the intermediate uh, range or, or the ones that are low magnification. So you can see the damage that these agents do to the cells and, and get familiar with, with doing that. Well, we put about uh, six hours into uh, ultrastructural pathology. Um, there are some other lecturers out there that do phenomenal jobs. Uh, Dr. Patty Pesavento often teaches this at uh, uh, the GenPath course, and she sprinkles a lot of these images into her lectures at the Descriptive Path course, and she does a great job, and I always learn something when I listen to her. Uh, Dr. Chiara Palmieri uh, does a, a, uh, a course in Australia on a, a yearly or every other year basis, which is great. And there's also a course at the University of Georgia. I have not attended, but I hear wonderful things about that. So if you're interested in this, certainly there is a need for people still to do this. And I commend, uh, I commend all those other groups for continuing um, to, to hold the torch high for ultrastructural pathology. Uh, thank you for, for hanging in for all these lectures. And as always, I wish you good health, a, uh, a good life, and be safe. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.